This week on Writers Inc. Without a doubt, I use that musical theater degree every single day and without the rejection, the nonstop rejection that I faced um, in attempting that career, I wouldn't be where I am as a writer because this job as well is <laughs> nonstop rejection um, in, in, you know, coming from every angle as well. And so that that resilience that I built up because of that experience really helped me um, be able to keep going when I faced it in, in this experience as well. J.K. Rowling was nearly homeless when she wrote the first Harry Potter book. Stephen King penned Carrie in a small desk wedged between a washer and dryer. James Patterson worked in advertising and famously crafted the Toys R Us theme song long before becoming an author. Join New York Times bestseller J.D. Barker and a panel of industry powerhouses as they pull back the curtain on some of the world's most prolific authors. Where do they start? What is their process? The biggest names in publishing all have origin stories, all have tips and secrets. What does it take to consistently top the bestseller lists and become a household name? Get your notepad out, school's in session. This is Writer's Inc. Hi, this is Christine Daigle. Patrick O'Donnell. Kevin Tomlinson. And J.D. Barker. Welcome to Writer's Inc. So be- before we get started, I have a question. Have any of you ever gotten DVDs from Netflix? No. Nope. Back in the day. <laughs> no, I just went to Blockbuster. Ago. <laughs> yeah, so they, they, used to, they used to do this. They basically killed Blockbuster, yep. I think, at doing this. You know, you could get DVDs by mail. Mm-hmm. I didn't realize it was actually still happening. They just put out a, a press release saying oh, they're yeah. going to stop that. They're discontinuing in September. So apparently oh, this wow. is, is still a thing. Um, but yeah, I just thought that was kind of interesting. How do you even do it now? I don't, I've never seen anything on the Netflix site about DVDs. I have no, I don't even have a DVD player anymore. Like Down I'm not even it. sure how to, yeah. what I would do with it. Like I, <laughs> I, I have a rental <laughs> car right now and like there's no CD player in there. And like, I'm thinking like, we don't even need right. that stuff anymore. Right. Yeah. Didn't Netflix offer to buy Blockbuster like for some ridiculous price? And they're like, no, 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 People still want to come to Blockbuster. You and your crazy DVD, you know, subscription service and all this other stuff. I, I wouldn't doubt it. I know they were owned by um, yeah. Wayne Heisinger owned most of it, a lot of it before it went public. He was a, a big shareholder in it. Uh, he also owned waste management down in um, uh, Palm Beach County and Fort Lauderdale, that whole area. Um, so there was a lot of money behind it. Um, but yeah, Blockbuster was around for a really long time. I, I was one of those guys. I mean, I remember the movies would come out on Tuesday. I, I you know, hit Blockbuster oh, yeah. at lunchtime. That was the earliest I could get in there and check out the new releases because you had to get in quick because they, you know, they were gone by like, you know, two, yeah. three o'clock. Um, you know, and get home and then I would copy those and probably, you know, watch like half of them. I probably didn't even watch it, you know, half the ones that I actually rented, um, just because I wanted to build up that DVD library. And, and now there's like, like we have DVDs. My wife still has a big collection that she just refuses to get rid of. Um, but you know, everything is streaming at this point, you know, so you can, you can watch it all online. Yeah. Yeah. I did do the blockbuster, you know, and like you said, all the bestsellers were always out. So I developed like a taste for renting B horror movies. That's what I would rent a lot of B horror movies from Blockbuster. I kind of miss that. I don't do enough B horror now. Yeah, it's an interesting how culture changed in response to that. Like it's it's there was a whole culture of go and find these crappy. That's in fact how um, Asylum Studios, the guys who brought you such hits as Sharknado, uh, yeah, they that's how they rose to prominence for a while was. Because of Blockbuster, they would find out whatever the top hit movie was, and then they'd make some schlock, you know, version of it uh, with a similar title and put it out over a weekend, and it would be in Blockbuster, and you're wandering around at 3 a.m., you know, trying to figure out what to what to do next, and you find this crappy movie you watch. Well, it was all about the cover, you know, like that the cover was key, just like it is today with with books um, in alphabetical order. You know, so if the most popular movie started with, you know, these couple of letters, they try to come up with something that was as close as possible. Say that box, you know, sitting right next to it. Yeah. So no JP today. He is off this week. Uh, Kevin, what's in the news? Well, uh, the U.S. needs its own book fair, turns out. Uh, There's a significant void in the U.S. publishing industry since the retirement of Book Expo in 2020, with many professionals believing the U.S. needs its own large scale publishing event. Publishers Weekly is filling the gap with the U.S. Book Show, a hybrid event, but there's a call for a larger, comprehensive platform for industry networking, rights trade, uh, rights trading, and uh, trend discussions akin to the international book fairs like Frankfurt and Bologna. Is it Bologna? Bologna? Bellini? 
Bologna. I would have gone with bologna, so don't ask me. Let's go yeah, with bologna. I'd say bologna, too. Uh, this is an interesting story to me because, you know, we, London our uh, book fair was um, – our book expo was one of the ones that we used to hit uh, at draft digital pretty frequently. Uh, London book fair is still a show that we'll go to. Um, so, yeah, I'd love to see a return of something akin to this. But how useful do you think this – this really is, you know, honestly, like I, I was at book expo once. Um, I couldn't tell you what year it stopped. It wasn't very long ago. Right. I think it was a couple of no, years, not maybe, too long ago. Yeah. Maybe yeah. right before COVID or something. Um, I mean, it's a fantastic networking opportunity, especially if they do it in New York. Um, that would probably be my re- main reason for going, um, you know, cause you basically get everybody all gathered together and a lot of business can happen. You know, if you're all you know going out to dinner, everybody's all in the same place. Um, but, but aside yeah. from that, you know, uh, how many more of these do we really need? I mean, the world has gotten small. Um, I know plenty of agents and publishers that will hop on a plane and head over to London or head over to Frankfurt. They attend all of these. I don't know that they really want to add another one to their their schedule. Right. Um, I don't know that the, the place in the world where it's taking place really matters that much anymore. What I seem to be seeing in New York is it seems like uh, conferences of all kinds have, have started to kind of fall off in New York. I, I don't know if it's really... I mean, I know it's the mecca for for publishing and all, but you know, is it, how important is New York at this point with it sort of decentralizing? Well, I'm wondering if it's part of a, a bigger thing, you know, because we've got indie publishing is is you know growing, you know, every every time you look at a chart, it's it's a bigger and bigger piece of that, um, which means the traditional market is shrinking because those people are going somewhere, um, and these types of uh, conferences, you know, and book expo, like all of that is born out of the traditional world. So I'm just wondering if like the need for that is has shifted, you know, the people that may have gone to that a couple of years ago, you know, maybe now they're at 20 books instead. Um, you know, that, that might be what, what we're really seeing happen here. Well, we have traditional publishers at 20 books now. Yeah. You know, Mark Cameron, you know, he's a big name. He's, he writes the Jack Ryan stuff, you know, Tom Clancy and some others, and we're getting more and more, they're interested in how indies do business. And, you know, it, it seems like for whatever your interest is, there's a conference out there for you to go to. There's all kinds of them. Yeah. Uh, next up, uh, DOE delivers potentially crucial finding in fight against book bans. Uh, the U.S. Department of Education Office for Civil Rights, or OCR, has conducted the uh, the Forsyth County School District's removal of books. They've concluded, rather, that Forsyth County uh, S- School District's revo- removal of books, I'll get through this, primarily featuring <laughs> black and LGBTQ <laughs> characters, potentially created a hostile environment for students infringing on their civil rights. And in a landmark resolution agreement, the district pledged to work with the DOE to tackle student discrimination issues stemming from the book bans. Um, The OCR decision considered an important milestone against book bans is hoped to act as a deterrent for other schools and libraries considering similar book removals. This is a, this this topic is very touchy and very complicated and much more complicated than even uh, these uh, articles about it make it seem because I, you know, most of what I hear about in, in my area about book banning, it has nothing to do with race or, or even LGBTQ. It's all um, sexualization and, and, and uh, some inappropriate content. Uh, it's hard. It's hard for me to get on board with banning books, but it's also hard for me to get on board with letting kids read about sex positions and, you know, that sort of thing. So what do you guys think? <laughs> <laughs> Coming off of that. Uh, I mean, the, the thing that jumped out at me on, on, on here, they're, um, they're, they put out a statement explaining their book removal process, which I, I think is important. Um, but, you know, playing devil's advocate there, I would like to see uh, their process for actually adding a book as well. You know, like it, it's one thing yeah. to take a book off the shelf. I would like to know how that book got on the shelf in the first place. And, and you know, I'm not opposed to, you know, like books getting into stores. My, my biggest problem or into the book. Uh, or into libraries. My biggest thing is I don't want one person to be the decision maker on either side of that that argument. It should be decided upon by the you know the community, you know whoever that library or that that location or that school or whatever who they represent. That's who should be making the decision. It shouldn't be one person um, calling calling those shots. So I think you know transparency there yeah. is good, um, but there needs to be transparency on both sides. Yeah, I agree. I'm not sure I feel about climate surveys. I get these at work and they're always like, they're anonymous. And I'm like, yeah, sure they are. So I never answer them. <laughs> like, right. So I don't know. If <laughs> yeah, I used um, to do that. Yep. The best way to do that. I'm like, yeah, sure. That's anonymous. <laughs> 
<laughs> Maybe I'm paranoid. I don't know. No, you're not. No, because I, don't I think went through paranoid. that at work as well. <laughs> yes. There's no such thing as anonymous. All of a sudden it's like, hey, you just got transferred. What? To some really shit assignment after right. this anonymous survey. I was like, what? Right. Yeah. No. I have, uh, I'm even, yeah, I don't I don't like surveys, period. So I'm not going to take any of them. But I'm definitely not taking one that, that could have uh, consequences in the community or my workplace. Uh, forget it. <laughs> Next up, uh, what what recent publishing controversies say about the industry? Um, recent, uh, th- I've been following this story actually. So, uh, recent turbulence has occurred within the publishing industry, notably due to new leaf agencies suddenly dismissing numerous authors. Uh, this event followed the quote amicable departure of agent Jordan. Uh, is it Hamisley? I believe uh, Hamisley, uh, leaving many authors some mid negotiation. Without representation, fewer quality publishing spots are available than ever, resulting from a series of changes such as industry uh, consolidation, disappearance of mid-tier publishers, and pandemic-induced economic impacts. This environment makes it increasingly challenging for agents to break out new books and create new hits. Uh, JD, you are probably best positioned to, uh, to talk about this first. Why don't you fill us in on your take? I, well, I've never been involved in this from the the agent standpoint. Um, my fourth monkey series, the first two books were over at HMH, um, which got bought out by Harper Collins. Um, my editor, you know, like they were basically when the, the buyout happened, the editors were told nobody was getting laid off. This wasn't going to happen. That wasn't going to happen. But the second the you know the ink was dry on the contract, they laid off a, a lot of people um, to, to eliminate redundancy and basically help that bottom line. My editor was one of those people that was let go, so I was kind of in limbo. Um, the, from my standpoint, though, like the, the books were selling really well. So like they quickly assigned somebody else to it, you know, so I didn't really fall out. Like I never really dropped off the radar. Um, I do have a, a friend um, who had a series and I don't want to put her name out there, but I think she was on book seven or book eight. Um, all of them, New York Times bestsellers, they all did extremely well. Um, and her editor was let go from her publisher. Um, that book never got assigned to a new editor, her basically her new book in that series. So even though they were making money, you know, it just it fell through the cracks. Um, the book was finished. It was, you know, basically sitting there, but she wasn't allowed to put it out anywhere else because it was under contract with that particular publisher. Um, and without an editor in, in house to, to champion it, it basically didn't go anywhere. And she's no longer a writer. Like she, that basically ended her career. Um, so th- this is a similar thing that's happening, I guess, but from an agent standpoint, um, you know, this agent was repping certain, certain people. They let the agent go or that agent left. Um, and now those, those clients are, are up in the air. Um, it's, it's a tough position to be in. I mean, one of the biggest headaches that I, you know, see in the publishing industry is you're just you're so dependent on all these other people, and you have zero control over you know what happens to them or what they do. Um, you basically just have to follow along, whether that's your agent, it's your publisher, whether it's the, the marketing people. You know, like everybody else has a you know control over what what's happening, except for you. Um, that's a scary thing. Um, I, if anything, I think these people need to just reevaluate their, their current situation, um, try to you know get back out there and, and hopefully find somebody else. Yeah. One more reason to be indie where you have complete control over everything. Yeah, that's where I was going with it, Patrick. <laughs> yeah, well, I was following this as you were, Kevin. Yeah, like on Twitter, I was following this and it just like, I don't know what happened, but it looks like 20 plus authors uh, are now not represented. Jordan did come out and say that... Uh, she wouldn't characterize her departure from New Leaf as amicable and didn't intend to leave those authors hanging. So it just kind of looks like a bit of a mess. So I don't know. Yeah. It, it's kind of like it, it's in like in gym class when you're playing dodgeball and you had to pick teams, mm-hmm. you know. So basically, <laughs> these, these 20 authors were were up there. You know, their their agent left. Now all of a sudden they're available. The other agents have to step up and pick them. Yeah. Um, if they don't get picked, you know, who knows what happens? Like I guess they get dropped. So I guess I have a question. Uh, just like when I was going through with other authors who were getting uh, their offers, they had talked about with their agents, you know, asking that question in your call of if you leave, what happens to me? Uh, so is it typical that you get a, you know, something in your agreement with your agent to get signed to a new agent or it just depends on the agency and what's going on? Because I know that's something some authors were pushing for hard when they were um, choosing who to sign with was if you leave, what happens to me? 
I mean, I can yeah. with with Kristen, like I was with Kristen Nelson, um, even though she owned the agency. Um, so I'm sure I would have gone with somebody else if she somehow retired or, or left. Um, with, with Alec, now I'm at Writer's House. Um, I believe I'd have to look at my contract, but I believe I'm actually signed to Writer's House. You know, he's my representation at Writer's House, but I believe they they are my you know agent of record. I guess is the the best way to put it. Um, I, I have no idea what that means though. Like, if he were to leave, you know, like does that mean they're going to put somebody else on my books? Um, who knows? But I've got a 30 day out. You know, so if I had to, I could end that contract and I could move on to somewhere else. I guess something to think about uh, if you're signing with an agent to yep. ask those questions. And what a tough question, though. That is a tough because, question. You know, it's a tough thing. To you, ask. If you're, uh, you don't want to offend anybody. This is a. I, I'm just trying to put myself in the shoes of these authors who, some of whom, have surely worked really hard to get this relationship in the first place, and didn't have a whole lot of other options or prospects, and now through no fault of their own, uh, they're, they're untethered and out kind of flailing in the wind. So yeah, what a, what a, what a difficult situation to find yourself in. Yeah, for sure. This episode is brought to you by AutoCrit. One of the most value packed memberships for any author, AutoCrit brings you an amazing suite of tools that make it a breeze to plan, write, and edit your books all in one place. AutoCrit takes you far above standard grammar checking or cookie cutter guidance. Instead, it's like having an experienced editor in your genre watching over your shoulder to help you deliver great writing that keeps your audience trapped in the story. You can even compare your writing style to more than 100 best-selling authors right down to the word level. So you can see what the best in the business do to keep their storytelling clean, clear, and crisp. Listeners of the Writers Inc. podcast can now take advantage of lifetime membership for one single fee. That's right, no renewal fees. Hi, this is JD Barker. I've used AutoCrit for years, and not only has it improved my writing, but it's been a crucial tool with aspiring authors that I've mentored. Whether you're a seasoned pro or just beginning, it'll help you find your weak spots and weed them out. Give it a shot with your latest project. Trust me, your editor will thank you. Head to autocrit.com slash JD to get your lifetime membership. Big thanks to Autocrit for sponsoring the show. All right, so JD, who's up this week? This week we've got TJ Newman. She's a New York Times bestseller of Fallen. Um, she wrote that one while standing in the back of an airplane working as a flight attendant. Ended up selling it for multiple seven-figure deals. She got seven figures for English print rights, another seven figures for um, for uh, the, uh, foreign rights, and another seven figures for the film rights. It was an insane, insane offering. Uh, her latest novel is called Drowning and releases May 30th. So here she is, TJ Newman. TJ Newman, thanks for being on the show. My pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. Well, I wanted to start out by thanking all of the flight attendants out there, and I'm sure you were the same when you were a flight attendant, for showing us below wing baggage apes <laughs> some love in the summertime by tossing us waters when you know we we were either closing the the main door or uh, pulling back the jet bridge, and you'd see us down there, you know, be like 100 degrees plus on the tarmac. You just got done loading or unloading the plane, and you're just soaked. It was just so unbearable. But you guys were always smiling, and you're always like, hey, you want a water? Are you guys okay? And I'm just like, oh, that was nice. You know, it's, it's one of those things where anytime I was on the plane and I'm looking out, and I'm I'm sweating on the plane, you know, in the middle of the summer, the door's open, the air, AC's barely working, you're in your uniform, it's hot, you're sweating. And then I look out the, the window and see you guys down there, the rampers, you know, <laughs> lifting heavy bags, you know, out in the sun. And I'm like, yep, I'm going to stop complaining. I'm fine here <laughs> in the pseudo AC. Here's some water. It's the best I can. It's the best I can give you right now. I can't offer you a cold beer, but here's a water <laughs> bottle. <laughs> and it was appreciated. Thank you very much. So I noticed in your latest book, Drowning, the airplane is an Airbus 321. And the airplane that Sully piloted on the Miracle on the Hudson was an Airbus 320. Is Was there a purpose behind that or is that just coincidence? That that was just coincidence. I'm um, the aircraft that I'm primarily flew the most on were Airbus and 320s and 321s were primarily what I flew during my career as a flight attendant. Um, so I'm partial to them because they're the plane I know best. And um, I wouldn't dare say I like Airbus over Boeing because that'll, you know, <laughs> cause a huge controversy and everybody will <laughs> come up in arms about that. So I won't claim a preference, but I will say that it's the the plane that I know um, better. And, and the A321 is... 
a bigger aircraft than the A320, which is what uh, Sully was flying. And it's an aircraft typically used for long, you know, uh, extended over water flights. So that's why I went with the A321. Okay. So you were a flight attendant for 10 years, correct? Yes. Let's jump back in time before you were flying, before you were this super duper writer that you were in New York City. Uh, were you on Broadway? You were trying to make it in uh, theater, right? I was trying to be on Broadway, but um, since we're not talking about what my next show is, I think we can guess how well that venture <laughs> went. It was um, it was not pretty. It I did not succeed in my ambitions at all. I I gave it my all and just got nowhere. Failed. Fell flat on my face and left New York um, and moved back to Phoenix, which is where I'm from, and, you know, moved into my parents' house and, um, you know, now a mid-20s college graduate with a degree in musical theater who was just told by the musical theater community that, you know, you aren't good enough, you're not going to cut it. Uh... And so what do I do with my life now? And uh, that's when I got a job at Changing Hands, which is the local indie bookstore here in Phoenix, Arizona. And that was sort of the moment that everything sort of started to shift into where I'm at now. Although it definitely was not an instantaneous uh, (laughs) step from there to here, not by any means. Now, your experience in New York, do you think that influenced your writing career in any way? Without a doubt. I use that musical theater degree every single day. And without the rejection, the nonstop rejection that I faced um, in attempting that career, I wouldn't be where I am as a writer because this job as well is (laughs) nonstop rejection um, and, you know, coming from every angle as well. And so that that resilience that I built up because of that experience really helped me um, be able to keep going when I faced it in in this experience as well. So your first book, Falling, that was written on the back of napkins while you were um, (laughs) working the red eyes. Uh, when you were a flight attendant, what was your process of transferring all these napkins or notes or however you did it onto a manuscript? How did you do that? Yeah, I would. Um, so I would write during the flight. I worked a lot of red eyes. Um, that's red eyes were where I came up with the idea for both falling and drowning. Um, and I loved working red eyes because one, I'm a night owl. Uh, And two, the passengers go to sleep and you're left to your own devices. So I would get everybody to sleep and then I would get to work. And, you know, I would write on the back of uh, catering bills or, you know, passenger manifests and scribble notes on cocktail napkins. And then um, because we weren't allowed to use portable electronic devices. Mm -hmm. And also there's something weird about the optics about like coming around the corner and seeing your flight attendant with like, her laptop out doing work <laughs> like that's just not not great optics which is why we weren't allowed to use portable electronic devices um okay. but then i would go to the hotel after that on my layover and i would you know take all of my notes take all my pages and and put them into uh the document you know on my on my computer and then um throw those notes away so for for a long time littered across the country in uh <laughs> you know, hotel trash cans were <laughs> the original notes and writings, handwritten writings of um, of falling. So that's how you did falling. How did you write their, your follow-up, I guess we could call it, drowning? What was your process for that? Yeah. And I, you know, I'm still figuring out what my process is because, you know, my process for the first book was wholly, you know, I couldn't, I couldn't recreate it. I'm no longer flying as a flight attendant. I'm no longer working red eyes. I'm no longer, you know, in a hotel every single night. So I had to figure out a new kind of process to, to writing, um, which I'm still figuring out what works for me. I'm still a night owl. So I still prefer to work, you know, all night long when everybody else is asleep. Um, But it's, 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 I'm definitely learning the idea of that it's work, meaning you just have to put your butt in the chair 
Right. And that's a self-discipline and a, a, you know, just something that you kind of have to force yourself to do as, as a writer, just to know that it's, you know, what's that, what's that great turn of phrase that, um, inspiration will find you, but it has to find you working. Yeah. Yeah. And so it's like, if you're, yeah, if you're waiting for the idea to hit before you get to work, it's never going to come. But if you're sitting there, you know, even if you're putting bad pages down, you're still doing the work. And that's where the ideas come from. So I'm still figuring out exactly what my day-to-day specifics of it are. And, but the one thing that I did do with this book um, that I think I realized like halfway through when, when I was realizing that a lot of sort of the serendipitous moments that I had when I was writing falling, like I would write falling, you know, on the plane and I would feel stuck in an idea and I wouldn't know where to go and I wouldn't know what to do. And then a pilot would come up and make a comment and I'd go, wait, what'd you say? And it would spark (laughs) something, you know? And so then I could ask a question and then it would go from there. And suddenly I figured out, you know, the, the solution to the problem that I was facing. Well, clearly I'm not having that, that, you know, sort of, uh, environmental, yeah. um, Inspiration. Yeah. So I decided, well, I need to replicate that as best I can. So I spent a tremendous amount of time in water. I would get in the pool and swim laps in the, the, the pool here at my building, you know, I would yeah. swim laps back and forth and just feel the water, feel what it's like to breathe underwater, you know, hold my breath as long as I could, you know, that type of thing until you think you're going to, you know, that type of stuff. I spent a ton of time in the bathtub. I actually have <laughs> a, it sounds crazy, but I have a, um, a scale model airplane of an A321. Yeah. And you, you know, the ones I'm talking about where like, oh, yeah. it's, it, comes in a box, you know, you got, it's, it's a, yeah, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Well, I would take that into the bathtub. And so then I would pretend, you know, that the plane was crashing on the water and visually see what that would look like. And I'd rip a wing off, you know, and see, well, what does that do to the weight and balance of the plane? If I do that, and if it was going to sink, what does the tail look like? You know? And, and so I would visualize it with that. I would also take a, um, a water bottle, like a clear water bottle into Mm -hmm. the bathtub. And I would, play with the amount of water that would be in it. Cause if you take a water bottle and flip it on your side, there's actually a scene in the book where one of the characters is describing what's happening yeah, in the plane. Exactly. The yes. Where he says, okay. And he takes a half empty bottle of water and puts it on its side. And he says, this is basically, imagine this is the plane, right? So here's yeah. the air bubble up here and the we're here. And then the water's down here and then you can move it and see how it shifts. That whole thing came about from me being in the bathtub with a water bottle, <laughs> okay. trying to figure out like, okay, how much water would it need, you know, for the balance to shift and what would this look like? And if I move here, the air bubble does what? So I tried as much as I could to um, create that sort of novelty and um, experience, you know, surrounding, you know, the the inspiration coming from the experience that you're having around you, I replicated it as, as best I could. Well, you're using different senses, you know, and you know, it, you, you know, I always tell writers that, you know, it's like, you got to get out, you know, it's, you know, it's like, okay, you've never done anything with your life. You know, maybe you went to school and then you think you're just going to be this best selling author and everything's going to be hunky dory. And usually, and I'm not going to say never, it doesn't work that way. Because you got to have some life. You got to have the sensory, you know, feelings, you know, like what you're talking about, you know, rejection, uh, you know, you're on an airplane, you're, you're fighting fatigue, you know, whatever else, but you're still writing the story, you know, and it's, it's such a neat story too, about you, you know, the flight attendant that's writing the book about like an air disaster. And, you know, you, you write this book falling and it's just this, you knocked it out of the park. It's, you know, it's still very, very popular. You know, I was looking at the rankings just on Amazon and man, you are way up there and it's been a little bit, you know, usually that kind of, you know, dips a little bit, but man, you're, you're just steaming forward in the new book drowning. All it is, is just rave reviews for that. And it's like heavy hitters that are saying that, do you miss the old days of writing on the back of napkins and flight manifests and just kind of toughen it out? I definitely don't miss the old days of, you know, being exhausted from working red eye after red eye and having right. passengers yell at me, especially when you see, you know, the the way it's been on the front line for uh, flight attendants for the past couple of years. Right. Um, Absolutely. I, I don't 
I don't miss commuting either. I commuted from Phoenix to LA, um, which is a brutal commute. Um, I don't miss any of that, uh, but I do miss the industry. And sometimes, you know, I miss my crewmates. But look, the fact of the matter is, I'm living my dream come true, right? And and I am, I am a full time writer, which is something I never thought I would be able to say. And it's a dream come true, and it is a privilege, and I am so grateful for it every single day. So. See, That's I, where I'm at primarily. I love stories like yours because you made your own luck. It just didn't fall into your lap falling. It didn't just fall into your lap. I mean, it just, yeah, you, know, you worked really hard and obviously the books are good. You know, I read Drowning and it's, it's a page turner. You want to see what happens next. And that's, I absolutely love that. And you started with the action right away. And I absolutely love that. It's like some books, you know, it's like, Oh, there authors spend so much time like setting the stage. And then all of a sudden it's like, I'm not interested in this anymore, but you did not. I mean, you're like, bam, you know, slapped across the face. It's like, let's go. You know, it's like, I love that. Thank you so much. I really appreciate that because it's something that I worked really hard at um, getting as right as I could possibly get it because, you know, it's like, it, there's been so much response to the book of like, Oh, it's so scary. It's an, you know, it's a, it's a plane and there's drowning and it's at the bottom of the ocean and a crash and explosion and all this. And it's like, yeah, that is what the book is, but that's just the setup. All of mm -hmm. that happens in the very, very front of the book. Like you're saying, the very first few chapters of the book, just set up the circumstances. And then we get to the real story, which is a rescue story and a story right. of a family coming back together and a story of love and hope and resilience. Um, and that I did that strategically sort of front loading the 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 setup. And I actually modeled it off of um, the opening of um, Saving Private Ryan in the way oh, where you know, from yeah. the first shot of saving oh, 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 Ryan, oh, you are, you are in it and it yep. does, you know, first 20 minutes of that movie, you are just in a vice grip. And yep. then after that, it, it moves into the story of what the story is of trying to save this one individual. And so I kind of use that as um, an inspiration of how to, cause you can't fatigue the audience too, right? If I right. keep, the peak level of tension, you know, of the spectacle of that for the entire book, you, your audience is just going to be absolutely fatigued. There has to be an ebb and a flow to it and figuring out that um, what that rhythm is, what that pace is, um, did take a lot of work. And I appreciate you saying, you know, how, how much work it was. You know, I said earlier that, you know, that, that great turn of phrase, you know, um, the, the inspiration will strike, but it has to find you working. And I feel like it's the same thing for luck. Like luck will yep. come, but, but it has you have to, to make your own. Yeah, exactly. You, you have to make to your own luck. You exactly. Because yes. if you're, if you're not doing the work, when you get the lucky break, you're not ready. Yeah. You're right about that. That's for sure. Now the first book falling, you had 41 rejection letters when you were pitching this book. How did you deal with that? Well, my time in New York uh, really helped, at least with with this rejection. It wasn't somebody, you know, sitting across from you saying directly to your face, you know, thank you and getting you to stop <laughs> singing your song and, you know, oh, exit ouch. the room. <laughs> but I'm actually not sure if it's actually worse the other way around because it's, you know, it's a silent rejection. It's like that, you know, you don't get the feedback. Sometimes, mm. you know, they didn't even have the the. The, I don't want to say the decency, but it's like, you don't even hear a response. So then you're, you're just waiting. You're hopeful. Cause if you don't hear a response, that hope is still there that, well, they just haven't told me that yes, they want to represent me, but that never, it never comes. And so I think it's like all rejection is hard, whether it's to your face or if it's sort of a silent rejection, but, um, but yeah, I think, you know, when I, when I was facing all that rejection, I, I kept returning to sort of this mantra that I would tell myself when I would be close to giving up, which was all the time. I felt all of those rejections and I wanted to give up constantly. And I would return to this idea of, I didn't come this far just to come this far. Mm. I 
done the work. I believed in the story and I believed that it just had to find the right home. And I just forced myself to keep going. Outstanding. Well, it's a good thing you did. Did you ever think about self-publishing being indie? I, I definitely considered it. I was definitely at the point of like starting to research it and starting mm-hmm. to figure out, you know, like, okay, I, because I, I believed in that story. And if nobody was going to represent me, then I would figure out a way to get this story out there one way or another. So I had started to to research that and think about that, if that would be a viable option uh, for me. Cause I mean, I think writers understand that when you have something that you believe in, it's, it's, it is about the idea. It's about the concept and it's about that story that you believe in more so than how it's going to get out there. Well, falling was taxiing for a while. We'll say that. And then finally it soared up into the sky. And like I was saying before, you know, it's, it's wildly popular. Were you surprised by how popular it was by all these big name people just like just gushing over it? completely, completely blown away and totally surprised. I still can't, you know, sometimes I'll look at the the cover and see a blurb and just like scratch my head and go, how did I go from an idea in a galley to scribbling notes on cocktail napkins to New York Times bestseller and that kind of blurb? I, my brain still does not know how to how to compute it, how to, how to make sense of it. It's, it really is a dream come true. That's awesome. So your sophomore book drowning, how much pressure did you feel with this book? You know, like I said before, you knocked, you know, falling out of the park, you know, everybody likes it, you know, instant hit and still a hit. Now you got to follow that up. Did you feel any pressure from that? Oh, just a tad. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, just a little. Um, Look, when I wrote Falling, I was, you know, I thought when I went to New York, I'd I'd used up my personal quota of public, you know, creative risk taking. And so when I wrote Falling, I wrote it completely in private. I don't even think I told my family I was writing something until I almost had the first draft completely finished. That book I told no one about. So, because it's easier to fail at something if nobody knows, right? Yeah, like when I went to New York, it was like, you know, you're young, you all your friends and family know, I'm going to live my dreams. And then, you know, shortly thereafter, you're, yeah, I'm I'm back home, living in my childhood bedroom, having failed. So (laughs) I didn't want to do that again. So I didn't tell anybody that I was writing the first book, which is why when the, you know, announcement came out that, you know, I'd gotten this big deal and this, I've written a book and it was being published and all this, (laughs) everybody in my life was writing me being like, Oh my God, congratulations. This is so incredible. Wait, you wrote a book? (laughs) Like nobody knew I was doing it. And that was a comfortable place for me to take risks and take chances and feel like if I failed, it wouldn't, it would just be me. It would just be me and the people closest to me in my life that, that knew that I hadn't hit my mark. So with drowning, uh, safe to say that situation was also not able to be repeated, um, sort of like the writing process. And I really had to, um, I had to figure out a way to mentally get myself in a place that I could quiet the critics in my own head so that I could do the work that needed to be done. And it took a while, I won't lie. It really took a while for me to get to the point that I could put pages down. I was, um, I was limiting myself. I was scared and I was, you know, even scared to put bad pages down. I really Mm. was just pretty tied up. And I finally had to get to the point, the way I was able to get out of it was I realized that I had to, my why for this book had to be different for my why for the first book. My why for falling was I believed in the story and I wanted to write it for me. I wanted to write that story. I wanted to know that I could do that. I wanted to know I could write that book and bring these people to life and tell that story. That book was for me. And with this book, the only way I could get to actually writing it was to say, this book is for them, meaning all the people who have been 
so supportive of me and of falling and the people who said, I love this book. I can't wait for your next one. The people who wrote a great review, the people who posted something on, you know, Instagram or Twitter, the people who enjoyed it, who spent their time and energy and money on a story that I came up with. I owed it to them to do sure. everything that I could to make this next book as good of an experience, if not better. And so that was the only way that I was able to overcome those expectations mm -hmm. is to know that I was doing it for something bigger for, for, I had the honor and the privilege of people's time and attention. And I don't take that lightly. And so I owed it to those people to do as best I could. And that was the only way that I could get out of my own, you know, insecurities and fears and move into what the work that needed to be done was. Well, we are definitely our own worst critics. I mean, most people are, you know, we're, we're brutal to ourselves. I mean, there is no doubt about that, but I always think back to like the music business. You have all these uh, rock bands or, you know, whatever that they have their first album come out and it's just a hit, you know, it's like, wow. And then the sophomore album comes and it's like, sometimes it's not as big of a hit or it flops. And, you know, I remember, I forget more than one musician being interviewed and they're like, I had my whole life to write and prepare for this first album. The second one, the, the music company wanted it like in nine months or 11 months, whatever the case may be. And he said, that's a lot of pressure, man. You know, it's, and I was thinking about that with you. It's like, you knocked it out of the park with your first book. But the second book it even seems like there, there's even more accolades for it. But I, I don't think you have anything to worry about with uh, drawing, but it is a good book. It really is. I I, I finished it up actually uh, yesterday. And like I said before, you just want to keep on turning the pages, which is outstanding. That's what you want. That means the world. Thank you. And yes, I, I somewhere along in the process, I, I, I had heard that that musician. I don't remember what musician said it, but I had heard that adage and I was like, that's exactly right. That he's exactly right. You have your whole life to, it was, you know, you got your whole life to write your first album. You got like six months to, to do the follow-up and that, that really is how it felt with this. And, and I just had to do the work. You can ask my friends and my family, how much they've seen of me over the last, you know, couple of years. The answer is not at all. Like I haven't <laughs> done anything over the last, like, I just haven't even left my house. It's just like, I, I've just been working as hard as I possibly can. It's, I mean, you know, opportunities. It isn't all glamour and, you know, high <laughs> brow, you know, cocktail parties. You know? <laughs> That's what people think, you know. A, yeah, there's, a there's the that, illusion and then there's yeah. the reality. And the reality is it's me up late, up early, you know, with a cup of coffee, just glued to my hand, just <laughs> working as hard as I can to write as good a pages as I can. Cause look, I know like opportunities don't come. Opportunities do not just come every day. And when you have them, you grab them with both hands and you don't sure. let go. And I am, I am not letting this opportunity pass me by because I know I don't take that opportunity for granted. And it's been so wonderful to hear um, that the reception of this book is so positive and I'm thrilled that people are enjoying it because that's all I want. I just want to entertain people and want to give them a good story. That's it. That's all I want to do. Outstanding. Now, when you were researching this book, either book, actually, you know, I would call this, you know, this is a thriller. You know, there's suspense, it's a thriller, all that good stuff. What are some of the common errors that you saw in books that, and I don't want you to name names, but some errors that you think writers make when they're writing a thriller? You know, what are they doing wrong sometimes? I don't think there's, I don't think that's really a question that has a good answer because I think the answer to that is, Look, if I'm if so, you got a thriller, right? You got a concept for a book, and one author is going to interpret that story one way, and another author may interpret it 
a different. I don't know that there's a right or a wrong mm. way to write anything. I think it's what is the right way for you as a writer to tell this story. And, you know, you may look at that story and go, I'm not sure that's the choice I would have made. I'm not sure that's the story, the way I would have told that story, but that's also not your story sure. to tell. And I think that's what's, what's great about books is that uh, you know, uh, my audience might like a story told one way and another audience might like a story told another way. And it's just a matter of finding, you know, your right audience and your right story too. Like, you know, these are, there's lots of thrillers that I wouldn't be able to write. Like they, that, that story wouldn't be something that I, my voice would be able to translate well in the same way that maybe another thriller writer wouldn't be able to translate my story well into their voice. So I think it's really not a matter of right or wrong, but just what's your story? What's your voice? What is what is the story that only your voice can tell well? And once you okay. figure out what that is, I think that's when you figure out what is right. As a follow-up question, if you were to mentor a rookie or maybe a not so rookie, but an author that's kind of struggling, what pieces of advice would you give them to help out? Keep going for one thing, like literally, it, and I don't care if it's what stage in the process you're at, if you're drafting, if you're editing, if you're, you know, querying, you're trying to get an agent, just keep going. That's it. Like literally just keep going. There is no replacement for the work. Full stop. Just keep going. If you believe in it, just keep going. The other thing too that I would advise is don't, don't, don't try to compare. It's very important to see what everybody else is doing, to be well-versed in what's going on around you, but find your voice, find your stories. Like I was just saying, that is, that is the most important piece of it. You know, when I, when I was writing Falling, which anybody who writes a book, it is, God, is it work? I respect <laughs> to the end of the day, anyone who writes a book and, and brings it to the point of you, you got a published book, you have my endless respect because it is so much work in the face of so much uncertainty and so much strife. And when I was writing Falling and facing rejection and, you know, doing draft after draft after draft and everything was hard and everything was uphill and you're not getting paid to do this. This is right. completely spending your own time, your own energy. You're not yep. going out with your friends or family. You know, you're 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 devoting yourself to this thing that is just being a problem. And I remember during that process, you know, as the self doubt is coming in, and I'm saying, why am I doing this? No one wants this. You know, this isn't. You know, when the self doubt comes in, I remembered a um, a seminar that I took once on entrepreneurship when I was, you know, trying to figure out what to do with my life after mm -hmm. I failed in New York, I took a entrepreneurship because it was like, well, should I start a business? And they use this great example of when you should start a business and when you shouldn't start a business. And they use this example of a, a pizza parlor. And they said, you know, look, anybody can open a pizza parlor. It's going to be hard. It's going to be difficult. And it's going to take a lot out of you. So you really have to have an answer to the question, why should I open this pizza parlor? Like, what is my pizza parlor going to offer that somebody else isn't, right? Why? Because you can have a pizza parlor on every street corner, practically. And if this is going to be as hard of a venture of opening a restaurant is, you really need to have a good answer for why should my pizza parlor be the one that people go to if I'm going to go to this much effort to do that? And that was kind of my litmus test also for falling where I looked around and went, I, I think this is an interesting angle that I can't believe no one has covered before. I think right. it's an interesting concept. I don't know who else has the access that I have and is writing like this. Like I I have the experience to back it up. Like I found what my little corner of the market was, why I should write that book. And so that would be something that I would say to a writer who's, you know, working on their own stuff now is what is your little corner like that? What is the one thing that, that you've got an angle on it and you've got the inside track on that nobody else does and everybody has it. 
Everybody has their corner. I don't care if you're, you know, a mailman who witnessed, you know, something. And now it's like, who else is going to write that, that book? Who else is going to write that book, but you and find out what that story is and then just keep going. Outstanding. Well, this is a good place, I think, for us to wrap this up. What's in your future, TJ? What are you working on? I'm working on launching this book. It comes out May 30th, and then I'm going on a uh, nationwide two-week tour uh, with that, which I am so excited about. Um, and because when Falling came out, we were still in the pandemic. So I kind of sure. did like a baby tour, but it really mm-hmm. wasn't um, possible to do a full-blown tour. So I am so excited to go on this tour and be in um in bookstores you know i'm a former indie bookseller myself so that's i i love doing events at changing hands so it's just so fun to be back out in stores so that is what is coming up i'm basically looking at the next 22 days not that i'm counting um the next 22 <laughs> days to publication and and that's it right now that's all um that's all i'm looking at right now This episode is brought to you by Master Writer. Master Writer is a powerful collection of writing tools and references assembled in one easy to use program. Included are word families, phrases, synonyms, rhymes, definitions, figures of speech, pop culture, a searchable Bible of intensifiers, and a unique collection of intense descriptive words. Why struggle to find the right word when you can have all the possibilities in an instant? While a computer can't compete with the mind and imagination of a writer, the mind can't compete with the word choices that Master Writer will give you in an instant. When the two work together, great things happen. Check it out today at MasterWriter.com. All right, guys. Welcome to Aviation Inc. Yeah, when did you load a plane? When when were you working baggage? <laughs> 2021. I was retired and... A buddy of mine worked above wing. He was a gate agent and he's like, and I saw him flying for free everywhere. And I'm like, I love flying. I love traveling. I got to do this. So I tried to get a job above wing. They were not interested in moi. So I went below wing where, you know, it's like, okay, do you have a strong back? Can you do this? You know, it's like, all right, that's me. And I did it for a summer. I was hired as a seasonal. And I tell you what, I had a blast, except it was over 100 degrees on the tarmac. And what I did not realize was when you're inside the belly of the plane, they call those bins, you can't stand up. So all the work you're doing, you're you're literally on your knees. And that's mm-hmm. real work. I My hat's off to all those people who do it. It's tough. Yeah, that, that just looks hard. Like I just I look outside the window and watch them and just you know, throwing bags around like that all day, like just the, the weight involved. I, mean, I imagine there's tons of back injuries and pulled this and pulled that. And, oh, absolutely. Uh, young, young man's game for sure. Yeah, I'm not young. I was There was only one other guy that was older than me and he had been doing it for a while. And I was like, oh boy. But yeah, I, it was a very enjoyable um, summer and I got to fly free, but it was standby. If you don't have specific plans, it's not so bad, but you're literally at the gate and you don't know if you're going to be getting on that plane for like till the last like five minutes, sometimes even quicker than that. So yeah. you got to be flexible. Well, heck, that's that's just flying Southwest these days. It's the same thing. <laughs> I did not work for Southwest. No, but it was one of the big sponsorship. Ones. That's a- yeah. <laughs> well, the the crazy thing about Southwest is, you know, bags fly for free. I think the first two bags fly for free. So everybody checks a bag. So those planes are always yeah. full. You know, there was like twice the number of baggage handlers compared to everybody else because it was free. But yeah, it, I would have to say this was one of the most enjoyable interviews I've done. She's extremely genuine and she's had just a ton of cool life experiences. Well, knowing, knowing her story and how she wrote that first book, you know, we, we, we interviewed her and I should have looked up the, the episode number, but it's out there. So if anybody's listening to this one and they want to hear her first one, just go back and, and look through the older ones. Um, I was really curious if she would be able to write a second book just because she wrote that first one under such yep. unique circumstances. Um, and you know, this happens to all of us, I think in a, to a, a certain degree, like I wrote my first book, you know, basically a hundred words here, like at lunchtime at, after 
at work in the car when you know stuck at traffic lights or whatever. You write it in little little pieces and kind of put it together. Um, but then when you make that mm-hmm. jump to being a full time writer and all of a sudden you know you're getting up and you're putting your butt in that seat and you're sitting there for you know four hours, five hours or whatever, it, it's a totally different environment. Um, and just you know the fact that you're changing that up, it, it, it changes your process. Your process is whole uh, completely different. Um, and you know whether you can get you know to the finish line is is kind of up in the air because you're not going through what you you did that first time around. So I, when I when I read um, her, her latest book, I was thrilled to to see that it is you know just as good if not better than the first one. Um, yep. So she definitely was able to to make that transition. Um, but the one thing that really got me though, is she threw away her notes. You know, she had mentioned that she she threw yes. away the napkins and yes, stuff. Yes, she did. Like, I, I am telling all authors right now, do not do that. Um, oh, just put them in a box somewhere. You just you never know. Yeah. You know, like these things could be valuable. You know, I am I am somebody who saw the original manuscript for Dracula. There's one copy in existence. It was found in a barn in Pennsylvania and sold the last <laughs> time for a million dollars. Um, I've got a copy of Needful Things sitting next to me, the actual pages off of Stephen King's typewriter. That wasn't cheap. I bought that at auction too. You know, this is stuff that many authors would just throw away. You know, they just don't think twice about it. it you know, if, if you're out there writing a book, you know, you, you clear off your desk when you finish up and a lot of authors just put all that into the circular bin or into a bag and they toss it out with the trash and don't think twice about it. But, you know, that, that stuff could be valuable. You just, you never know. So I was going to ask you guys, what's the most unusual place you have written you know, your book or your, you know, notes or wherever, what's some of the unusual places you guys have done it? Jeez. I mean, for me, the strangest place I I wrote the ending to fourth monkey in the room at the Stanley hotel where Stephen King stayed when he came up with the idea for the shining. Oh, Um, okay. So I was, my my wife and I were out there for a, a, it was a horror writers, um, like a writing retreat kind of thing. Um, so that, that's probably my weirdest place. Um, the basement of the Stanley hotel is also a fun place to write. You know, where the, the boiler would be if there really was a boiler. Yeah, that's cool. All right, Kevin. Ah, uh, where haven't I written? I don't know. I, I uh, you know, I did, we did the whole van life thing and RV life thing. So I've, I've got oh, yeah. the opportunity to write in some really interesting places, but usually in the context of, of sitting in a van or cafe nearby, not really. I guess I, I did write some chapters for my, one of my first books at, while literally sitting at the foot of the Eiffel Tower. That was a uh, an experience, and then I got I, I finished even more of it on a train from uh, Paris to um, Brussels. So I got to have that sort of European experience. I guess I was determined to get that experience. By the way, when we when we when we were first saying we were going to Paris, uh, I, I announced very loudly that I would be writing something at the foot of the Eiffel Tower. So I, I wrote two chapters or so sitting there just to prove it. <laughs> you probably paid about thirty dollars for a cup of coffee too. Yeah, exi- exactly. <laughs> they, they get you. I don't think I've you know I don't write weird places. I mean the train for sure. When I take the train to Toronto, I always write. But I'm a weird reader. Like I'll read in weird places because that's just easier to do. I have read at children's birthday parties. <laughs> like I'm like I don't want to deal with this. I'm just yeah. gonna read. You're that mom, so, okay? I'm that mom for sure. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was finishing my cops and writers books. You know, these police procedurals. I'm sitting in my squad car, and I had my laptop against my vest and the steering wheel, and I hear just gunshots everywhere. It was like a block away, and I'm like, "Oh man, it's a Sunday afternoon, like at noon. Come on!" So I pack up all my stuff, and I go, and sure enough, that was one of the last homicides I had to deal with. Your stories are always so uplifting, Patrick. <laughs> like I said, the Hallmark yeah. Channel is breaking my door down all the time. It's like, this guy is so cheery. There's always a happy ending with me, you know? You know what I thought was interesting, though, <laughs> that she was talking about? It's like how her process changed from when she was um, writing on the plane to then having models of the plane in the bathtub. <laughs> well, that's a sensory thing. Yeah, she was trying to recreate the sensory thing, you know? And I was going to ask you guys... What have you done to like immerse yourself into a project like that? Have any of you done that? Um, you know, it, it something I almost did. I had a friend well, when she was speaking about it. I almost also almost did something similar because I was writing like a I can't remember a fight battle scene, and one of my friends in in my real life writing group at that time was a marine who was also big into um, 
you know, like role playing games and all of that. So it's like, come over, I'll set it up for you. The buildings, the people will set it up and we'll like all map out how it would go. And I was like, I probably should have done that. I didn't end up doing it for whatever reason. But, you know, I think using models to visualize what's going on in your writing isn't a bad idea at all. I really like that. I, I've hated all of my daughter's little bath toys. Like she's got a big box of toys in the bathroom. And I, 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 I like a week ago, I would have probably wanted to like throw them all away. I think I'll let her keep them all. Cause like if, if it's going to lead to writing a book, <laughs> why, why not? How about you, Kevin? What have you done to immerse yourself? Uh, immersing. Well, I, you know, again, it comes down to the travel. Like I've, I've traveled to places that have ultimately ended up in my books and uh, explored those areas. And one of my, one of the things I do anytime we travel, anytime I'm in a new city, I, I walk that city and that's not always the safest thing to do, but I've, and I've walked some pretty rough neighborhoods in some, in a variety of cities around the world. But, uh, I feel like you don't really, you can't quite know a city quite as well. Uh, you can get to know a city through, you know, video and, Google Maps and that sort of thing, uh, you can kind of experience it, but you don't quite get the nuance of it unless you're right there in the middle of it. So a lot of those details end up in my books. That's probably the most immersive thing that I do. I started thinking about JD with the scene with rats in Fourth Monkey, and I'm like, okay, <laughs> I hope you don't have pet rats at home, JD, and you're practicing that. <laughs> oh, I thought you were going a different direction with that. I thought you were going to, you know, suggest that he's been taping, uh, you know, buckets of rats to people. And <laughs> <laughs> no, this for, game, for the record, I have not. That, <laughs> this was a torture that he had. <laughs> for all law enforcement uh, listening, JD has not done this. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I, I've thought about this. I, I don't think there's anything I've actually like acted out or tried in any of my books just to see if it's really plausible. Um, I know plenty of people that that do that. I know a lot of authors that have um, like those little figurines of people, um, you know, so they choreograph their fight scenes, you know, right arm does this, left arm does that. And like they they literally have like a you know a little doll in front of them that they use in order to make sure that they get all that accurate um, I, I am just not that guy. Um, I, it reminds me of a story that, you know, Stephen King has told a bunch of times, you know, when he was writing Gerald's game, he handcuffed his son, Joe to the bed, um, and told him, okay, now you need to try and flip over the back and see if you can push the bed across yeah. the room and get to this, you know, the glass of water that's over at the other side. And while they were practicing, practicing this, um, his wife walked in and, and saw him and he had to explain <laughs> what they were up to. Um, <laughs> that, you know, but I, I've never tried anything like that. Maybe I should, maybe it'll be more realistic if I actually do. <laughs> <laughs> so how do you guys feel about like at the beginning of this book it's a lot of action how do you feel about you know a lot of action just kind of like grabbing you by the lapel and pulling you in like right away without setting too much of the stage for your reader i i try to do that in all of them um you know, she had mentioned the saving private ryan you know that's basically how yep. that one starts off i i think of it as indiana jones because they start every indiana jones like that um you know it's crazy wild action scene and you know sometimes it has nothing to do with the the final story um but it just it completely ropes you in um and then you could take that little bit of a breather right after that and introduce characters and kind of you know slow things down so i think it's a great way to just capture the reader and, and hold on yeah I agree. I mean, I think it depends on the book, but I like when a book starts with action, but I have to care about the action. So if you can pull that yeah. balance off, I, I like it as an introduction for sure. Yes. And I think she does it very well. Yeah. That that rule of start in the middle of the action is, is a good, decent rule, but uh, you have to do it right. You can't just explode onto the page. Or maybe you can. I don't know. What do I know? <laughs> awesome. Okay. And with that, JD, who's up next week? Next week, we've got Tessa Bailey. She's a number one New York Times bestselling romance author. Entertainment Weekly actually called her the Michelangelo of Dirty Talk. I have no idea what that means, but I am very interested in finding oh, out. Oh, you're going to find out. <laughs> her latest novel is called Unfortunately, uh, Unfortunately Yours and releases June 6th. Sounds great. If you'd like to be notified as soon as new episodes publish, make sure you go to writersincpodcast.com and sign up now. We'll see you next episode and have a great week of writing. 
Do you want to write crime stories that are accurate and believable, but lack first-hand experience in law enforcement? Join Cop Camp, the Cops and Writers interactive conference, and experience what real-life police officers and detectives do through hands-on activities this June 1st through the 4th at the Fox Valley Police Academy in Appleton, Wisconsin. Limited class size of 30 to 40 students ensures an immersive, interactive experience. Attend firearm simulations, drive a squad car, solve mock crime scenes, and use real CSI tools and more. Register now at premeditatedfiction.com forward slash cop camp 2023 and take your crime writing to the next level. Thanks for listening to this episode of Writers Inc. Access the show notes and leave a comment at writersincpodcast.com.